Nathaniel Winkle. Nathaniel Winkle. Nathaniel Twinkle. And Nathaniel Simple. Nathaniel Dimple. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Have the goodness, sir, tell his lordship and the jury what your name is. Winkle. What is your Christian name, sir? Nathaniel, sir. Daniel. Any other name? Nathaniel, sir. The Lord, I mean. Nathaniel Daniel or Daniel Nathaniel? Uh, no, my lord. Only Nathaniel. Not Daniel at all. What did you tell me it was Daniel for? I, I didn't, my lord. You did, sir. How could I have it on my notes unless you told me so? Ah, uh, you, you had better be careful, sir, and mind what you are about. Now, Mr. Winkle, I believe you are a particular friend of the defendants, are you not? I have known Mr. Pickwick now. Friends, Mr. Winkle, do not evade the question. Are you or not a particular friend of the defendants? I was only yes. just... Oh, no. Yes, I am. Ah, and perhaps you know the plaintiff, too. Eh, hey, Mr. Winkle? I've seen her. How often have you seen her? How often? Yes, Mr. Winkle. How often? I'm prepared to repeat the question a dozen times if you require it. Oh, it's impossible for me to say how many times. Well, have you seen her 20 times? Oh, certainly. More than that. Oh, more than that, eh? A hundred times, perhaps? I couldn't swear to a hundred. Oh, you couldn't. Well, could we say 75 times? Uh, more than 50? I'm afraid 50 seems to be an awful lot. Well, no matter, no matter. Do you remember calling on the defendant at the plaintiff's house one morning last July? Yes, I do. You were accompanied on this occasion by two other gentlemen of the names of Tupman and Snodgrass. Were you not? Yes, I was. Ah. Now, sir, tell the jury what you saw on entering the defendant's room. Mr. Pickwick was holding the plaintiff in his arms, and the plaintiff appeared to have fainted. Did you hear the defendant say anything? I heard him call Mrs. Bardell a good creature and ask her to compose herself for what a situation it was if anybody should come. Words to that effect. Indeed. Now, sir, can you swear that you did not hear Pickwick say on this occasion, my dear Mrs. Bardell, compose yourself to this situation, for to this situation you must come, or words to that effect? The impression on my mind. Gentlemen, the jury wants none of the impression on your mind. Will you swear that Pickwick did not use these words? No, I will not. Ah. <coughs> <coughs> uh, now, I believe Mr. Pickwick is not a young man. Oh, no. Old enough to be my father. Has his behavior toward females been that of a man who treats them like a father might his daughters? Oh, yes, certainly. Then, uh, uh, then you've never known anything in his behavior toward Mrs. Bardell or any other female in the least degree suspicious? Oh, no. Uh, except, uh, except for one <laughs> trifling occasion, which I'm sure might be easily explained. Uh, thank you, Mr. Winkle. You may leave the box. Stay, Mr. Winkle, stay. Your Lordship kindly ask the witness what was the one occasion of suspicious behavior with females? Describe the occasion, sir. Uh, my Lord, I'd rather not. Perhaps so, but you must. Well, Mr. Pickwick was once seen in a lady's uh, sleeping apartment mm -hmm. at midnight, which terminated, I believe, in the lady's breaking off her projected marriage. You may leave the box, sir. Call Susanna Saunders. Susanna Saunders. All, all that happened was that once in a country inn, Mr. Pickwick stumbled along a corridor into what he thought was his room. It wasn't. And he was out of it before the lady could chase him out. The whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Uh, now, Mr. Saunders, I shan't keep you long. Have you always believed that uh, Mr. Pickwick and Mrs. Bartle were engaged to be married? Oh, always, sir. And did you know, in fact, that Mrs. Bartle was engaged to Mr. Pickwick? Oh, yes, sir. It was the gossip of the neighbours.
Pimper Road Have... after she fainted, I mean. Have you ever heard Pickwick address any words to young Master Bartle? Oh, yes, sir. I heard him saying, how would he like to have another father? That is all. Thank you very much. And that is my case for now. Just one moment, uh, Mrs. Saunders. Uh, has Mr. Saunders ever had occasion to call you in correspondence, uh, chops? Chops, Your Honour? Oh, no, sir. Or tomato sauce? Oh, no, my lord. But, um, <laughs> he sometimes calls me duck. <laughs> oh, indeed. Is he particularly fond of duck? Yes, my lord. Come to think of it, he is. Mm -hmm. You may go down. <coughs> Are you ready, Sergeant Snubbin? <coughs> Miller, gentlemen of the jury, <coughs> I shall be extremely brief for the simple reason that this preposterous charge deserves nothing better than a quick and contemptuous dismissal. <coughs> the only evidence in this case is two short letters which clearly relate to Mr. Pickwick's dinner. On one occasion, he would wish to have chops and tomato sauce. On the other occasion, he was coming in late from a country excursion. A winter excursion, I might add. And he naturally wished to avail himself of a warming pan. It is beyond comprehension why 12 conscientious jurors should be asked to waste their obvious intelligence in distorting these homely events into a diabolical plot even, if I may say so, with the artful help of my distinguished colleague, Sergeant Buzzbuzz. <laughs> I shall not detain you, gentlemen. That, my lord, is my case. That, my lord, is my case. <clears throat> gentlemen of the jury, <clears throat> I think it will be better if I recreate this case from my notes. You are the judge of the fact. This court alone is the judge of the law. Mrs. Bardell has brought witnesses to show that the defendant proposed marriage to her, leading to his subsequent deceit with a series of endearing phrases such as chops and tomato sauce. I never heard them myself, but you heard the witness Mrs. Landers, uh, no, no, Sanders, say her husband calls her duck because he's fond of ducks. If he were similarly fond of uh, chops, I suppose he could be expected to call her chops. Then you have the evidence of the lady who saw the door, how did she put it? On the jar. On the jar. That, I imagine, is very important. Now, your duty is very plain. If Mrs. Bardell is right, it should be perfectly clear that Mr. Pickwick is wrong. If you think, however, that the evidence of Mrs. Uh, Cluppins is worthy of credence, then uh, you will believe it. If not, then you won't. If you find a breach of promise has been committed, you will find for the uh, plaintiff with such damages as you think proper. If it appears to you that no promise of marriage was ever given, you will, on the contrary, find for the defendant. Uh, I must warn you, there will be no damages at all. Now, your duty is plain. You will retire and discharge it. <clears throat> so, said Dickens, the jury retired to talk the matter over, and the judge retired to refresh himself with a mutton chop and a glass of sherry. There was an anxious quarter of an hour, and then the jury came back, and the judge was fetched in, and the clerk rises. Gentlemen, are you all agreed on your verdict? We are. Do you find for the plaintiff, gentlemen, or for the defendant? For the plaintiff. With what damages, gentlemen? 750 pounds. <laughs> Thank you.
Gentlemen. Well, sir, you imagine you get your costs, don't you? We think it highly probable, sir. We shall try, sir. We will try. You can try and try and try again, but not one farthing of costs or damages will you ever get from me if I have to spend the rest of my existence in a jail. Oh, surely don't really mean seriously, sir, that you won't pay these Not costs one and penny! Mr. Pickwick. Not a farthing! Mr. Pickwick. Not a farthing! Right, 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 well, father. Well, Sammy, my boy, what happens to you now? Well, I imagine the Somali ingenious ways of getting into prison myself. No, Sammy, you don't mean you're going with him. Well, certainly I do. I can't even shine his own shoes. And you know that they tell me the accommodations of the fleet are somewhat limited. Some of the guests there find them highly agreeable. Oh, Sammy, I knew what would happen with this mode of doing business. Mr. Pickwick ought to have had an alibi. Oh, Sammy, Sammy, why weren't there an alibi? Well, Mr. Pickwick was as good as his word. He did not pay the damages, and he did go to jail. But Dickens is the last author who would leave his hero unhappy, even in jail and especially on Christmas Eve. So as a little epilogue to our story, we should like to give you a tableau showing you what happened Christmas Eve 1936 in the Fleet Prison in London. Hail the new ye lads and lasses. See 